All right, it's the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see you all here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, creator, and chief editor. And for the next hour, I'll be your guide, facilitator, moderator, and senior as we try to explore the future of learning innovation in higher education. But before we do that, let me just introduce the program, explain uh, what it is, how it works, where it came from, and then I'll introduce this week's guest. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I just want to let you know that the forum has been going on for more than four years. We are, in fact, starting our fifth year right now. This is something I think we should all be very, very, very proud of. Um, the forum is a discussion-based venue. This is all about conversation, about the back and forth, exchange of ideas, questions, answers, pushback, and celebration. Uh, it's not about presentation. It's not about, it's not a webinar per se. It's all about conversation. It's all about what you all would like to do and say with our guests each week. Now, the forum is part of an ongoing research project that I've called the Future of Education Observatory. Now, this is a multimedia, multimodal attempt to wrangle the future of education. So this includes this forum. It also includes a blog. It includes a book club. It includes a monthly trends analysis and more. So if you're interested in that, just go to futureofeducation.us to learn more. Now, we do this work with the help of some generous sponsors. I'd like to acknowledge them before we proceed. To begin with, NyserNet from New York State uh, is a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities do great work online together. Uh, we're very pleased with them uh, and their work, and we're delighted they can support us. We're also grateful to Shindig for making available the technology that we're using right now. So before we go further, let me just take you on a quick tour of how this works with an eye towards your participation. Where I am right now, and where this slide is for just a minute, called the stage. And it's called that because everyone involved in this conversation can see and hear what goes on on stage. This is where our guests will be, and this is where you can be, too. I'll show you how to do that in a second. And right below us, you should see around you up to 18 or 20 different people that's right. In fact, right now, I've got 34 people who are all signed in. I think it best is the participants swarm. Uh, you can see different people, you can mouse over them to learn more about them. So if you uh, mouse over a Mo Petzl, you'll see they meet the Cornell College, the director of academic something. You can find out more by clicking on him and asking him. Um, hello, Mo, picking on you right now. Uh, if you, you'll see on either end, there should be a Chevron button that lets you page between uh, different rooms. Now, next to them, you'll see a couple of buttons. Uh, one of them is a button for purchasing the book that we'll be discussing today. So I'm sure the authors and their publisher would be delighted if you clicked on that button. Now, below that is where the real interaction happens. You should see a few different buttons lined up. One of them is a raised hand icon, and one of them is a question mark. So if you click on the question mark, that'll give you access to a little box where you can type in a question or a comment. Easy as that. And I'll get that, and when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen so that everybody, including our guests, can read it, and I'll read it out loud so everybody, including our guests, can hear it. Now, that works really well uh, if you are in a position where you can't use video. Say you don't have a camera, your bandwidth is insufficient, or you don't feel comfortable with it. But if all those conditions are met, and you are comfortable, you've got a camera, you're ready to go, click on the raised hand button. That tells us that you want to join us up here on stage. And the minute that's ready, I'll just click a button and you'll appear right alongside us and you get to ask face-to-face -face questions of our guests um, as easy as can be. So those are the two really big ways, either using the, um, the question mark for the text question or reason the raised hand button to join us on stage. And if you're a Twitter user, and I think some of you are, I know some of you are, just use the hashtag FTTE and you can throw questions out there. Uh, I'll be checking Twitter as we go, and if I can, I'll squeeze out some tweets as well. Um, but that's often a good way for people in the conference to be able to shout out what they see as most exciting and interesting. And sometimes there'll be people who can't make it, say they're lacking bandwidth, and they'll follow the tweets, and then they'll tweet questions at us, which is pretty exciting. So all of this is to say, we have the technologies for you to participate. This is a community effort, not one that uh, is driven by myself, but by your questions, your needs, your thoughts. Uh, we're really grateful to Shindig for making the technology available. We're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. If you don't know Patreon, it's a crowdfunding service that lets you support some creative ongoing work. And here, it lets us support our work in the future of education. 
So people contribute as little as a dollar a month. And in fact, if you look at this slide, you can see people who contribute $10 or more a month. People like Michael Hoggins, Chris Sandoper, Matthew Henry, Jimmy Kim Hong, Chris Johnson, David, Jay Gary, Kimmy. We're really grateful for them. Uh, and we can't do this without them. And if you'd like to join them, just go to patreon.com slash Alexander. Now, one quick note, just as a little bit of self promotion. If you haven't already seen it, my new book has just come out. So you can get Academia Next, The Futures of Higher Education, and John Hopkins University Press. I and a publisher will be delighted if you will grab one or grab several, and we're we'll always happy to talk about it. Now, so much for an introduction. Now, speaking of books, I'd like to introduce this week's guest. The authors of a terrific brand new book on learning innovation and higher education. Our guests uh, are wonderful, important people in the whole space of higher education. Um, they're very, very accessible. I promise they won't bite. Um, and they will, in fact, be here to answer your questions and your thoughts. So let me first introduce uh, my colleague uh, and good friend, Eddie Maloney. Uh, Eddie is at Georgetown University, where he is a professor and the executive director of the Candles Program. Eddie, greetings. Hi, Brian. How you doing? Great. Very good to see you. You as well. How are things there? Things are good. Where are you? You're not. You're not on campus, are you? No, I'm actually at home right now. Oh. Um, so. Very nice. Very nice. It's rainy here in DC, so Maybe. good day not to commute into campus. Um, it is rainy here as well. My uh, cats are very disappointed with this, and they hold us all personally responsible. So, Brian, uh, I, I've noticed that your voice kind of goes muffled in and out. So I'm not sure. Um, sometimes I can hear you, and sometimes I can't. I'm not sure if everyone else is having that effect as well. Um, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. It may just be a proximity question. I'll make sure to speak a few inches closer to the mic. And if anybody else is having issues with this, uh, please say something in the chat. Um, to give people a sense of, of I'm not sure if I'm the only one who can't see Brian anymore, but now I can see you. But, but I, um, I, I guess I may have faded out for a second there. Um, uh, my, my question was to introduce you to people, give people a sense of who you are and what you do. Could you just tell people what you're going to be working on for the next year? What are the big issues, the big projects, the big topics that are most in your mind? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for throwing one out that I hadn't really thought about. What am I going to do with my life? That's what you're asking, Brian? That's, that's for 2020. Um, so as Brian knows, uh, we, we actually just launched a graduate program uh, in learning design and technology. Uh, it's uh, a program that Brian teaches in. Uh, we're really lucky to have him teach uh, a number of classes. Our students absolutely adore Brian. Um, it is a program that I am really excited about growing and thinking about its next uh, stage. It's now about three years old. We've had some wonderful students. I see, in fact, one or two of them are online here today, uh, One of our, a couple of our graduates as well as current students. Um, we have, uh, so in the next couple of years, we're gonna be really kind of refining the curriculum, thinking about what it means to take that program online. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff that's happening uh, in that space. As we kind of think about the work that we're doing uh, in learning innovation, not just about how we have an impact um, on campus at universities, at our university, universities across the world today, but how we help train folks um, who are gonna be doing that work for generations to come. Enormously ambitious and uh, completely appropriate, given your background, expertise, and wonderful skills. Uh, uh, thank you. Glad to hear that. Well, let me bring on board your co-conspirator. Uh, let me bring on board Josh Kim. Uh, Josh is coming to you from Dartmouth, where he is the director of online programs and strategy. How are you doing, Josh? Hi. Hey, Eddie. Good to see you both up on the stage. Oh, I'm glad to see Josh. you. So I, I asked Eddie a question, and I'll ask you the, the same question. Uh, to introduce you to people, Josh, besides saying this is a man who writes more than any other commentator on Earth, he writes a daily column somehow for Inside High Red, it's for years, which is a mandatory reading. But besides that, 
what are you going to be spending your time on over the next uh, year? What's going to be uppermost in your mind? Um, well, I'd say a couple things. The first thing is Eddie and I are talking about what our next book will be. Already? So, yeah. Yeah. Because, um, you know, one of the most gratifying um, elements, and we talk about this in the book, is my, my day job, I'm an administrator at Dartmouth. I, I work to try to develop new low residency and online programs. I'm in lots of meetings. Um, and it's very gratifying. We're doing great stuff. It's, it's very exciting. But um, what, what really gets me going and what's really exciting is the, the scholarship and trying to figure out how to carve out a life as a non-faculty member to mm -hmm. do this kind of research. It, it's a real challenge. It's a real joy. So that's what I'm thinking about for the next year. That's a lot. That's a lot. Both of you present as enormously ambitious gentlemen. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, but before we talk about your next book, um, and I approve of the way that you're charging ahead with that, tell us more about learning innovation and the future of higher education. Uh, to begin with, let me ask, what's, what kind of reception has it got? What kind of feedback, what kind of pushback, what kind of uh, support have you heard from readers? Uh, well, that's a great question. It, it's actually just out. So it came out on Tuesday, uh, at least officially. Some folks had it early. Uh, if you ordered it on Amazon, uh, for some reason, it came a couple weeks early on Amazon, but um, if you ordered it through Johns Hopkins, which uh, we know a lot of folks uh, did, uh, it, it actually probably hasn't even arrived yet um, at many people's uh, offices. So we haven't had a lot of feedback, uh, direct feedback on it, but we've done uh, a, a couple of podcasts, a couple of conversations with folks, and had some feedback on the ideas that we're, we've been sharing um, in that space. And we're excited to hear what people are thinking about the book. Well, let, let me ask the, the two of you, um, I mean, thinking about the book then, and uh, congratulations on its fresh appearance, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we can be this cutting edge. The book is fresh off the presses, and we get that, that new book smell. That's right. But uh, you know, thinking about this, one of the topics that you raised, that both of you have been exploring for years, is the question of creating a kind of discipline of learning innovation and learning design. Uh, Eddie, we've had you as a guest in the program talking about that. And I wonder, in, in 2020, where do you think that stands? I mean, are, are we in the cusp of creating such a discipline or a professional field, or is this mutating into something else? I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, in, in researching the, the book, when we tried to uh, float this idea that what we're doing ha has the contours of an academic discipline, mm. um, and we, we tried to sort of talk to a lot of people, and. Almost everyone thought that we were crazy to say that. They thought basically this is a terrible idea. Yeah, can I, if I could just jump in, um, and both to kind of offer a slight counter to that, but also, you know, sort of suggest that some things are happening that would, um, that are new, including your book, Brian, and our book, and books that are coming out in this space that I think are contributing to this conversation. We actually did hear from, from some folks who were concerned that we were trying to reconstruct um, an academic model that might, you know, be on its way out or might have certain kinds of limitations. Um, so, uh, you know, we try to think about an interdisciplinary field as a way of not quite countering that, but acknowledging that what we're talking about is the intersection of a number of different fields. And because of that intersection, how they're kind of coming together in a particular space, um, that, they're, that that intersection asks a, a set of questions, forces a set of questions that are not being asked in each of those disciplines that sit around that. I mean, one of the things that we heard uh, as we've talked to folks, we've interviewed folks for this book, 
is that we had many, as Josh said, who said, you know, I don't want to do that. That actually um, make would make my job a little bit more difficult. I'm already able to kind of push boundaries. And if you start to create additional boundaries, it'll be harder for me to do my work. Um, we also heard from folks that they felt like that discipline already existed. And so why would you try to argue for something new to come into being? Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the, the third and probably just as common uh, response that we received was, yeah, we really need this. This is something that would allow us to kind of think in this way that no one else is doing this. We haven't thought about it in this way. And so the fact that there are three or, or more different responses to that question, to me, is actually fruitful. It, it says that there is something that needs to be explored. Um, we don't have agreement on this, and that's a good thing. Um, we all kind of approach our work in different in different ways from different directions. We think about this work both from a scholarly perspective and from a practical perspective. It's applied, um, but it's also uh, it's necessary to have a research basis. There are all sorts of questions um, that come out about this work, not just our book, but your book and the books in this in this space about. I mean, how is data driving these questions? How are we making decisions? Are we, you know, as, as we, we saw yesterday, just in an echo chamber, or are we actually trying to push the thinking forward in good ways? Um, you know, the fact that people are asking those questions and pushing on, on this work in, in good ways is actually really fruitful from a disciplinary or interdisciplinary perspective. It means that there are questions we need to try to answer together. There are questions that we can explore together. There are problems that we have that if we can come together around methodologies or we can even challenge methodologies together, that there's an opportunity to do something. Um, if, if, every, if everyone said it's done, great, or if everyone said it's needed, but you know we don't know why, but if everyone said don't do this, I think you know that would be an easy easier place to be. Um, but I think we're actually in a really nice kind of moment of tension where we're trying to figure this out. Productive interdisciplinary tension. There you go. Oh, thank you. Those are both great answers to this. And before I can ask any more questions, people have already started firing up their own. So let me just quickly add uh, uh, Fred Bashir's fantastic person, asks this question. Yuval Harari says that organizations like schools may someday know more about us than we know about ourselves. Would this be an ideal, intelligent tutoring environment? Uh, well, I, 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 I'm not sure. Um, it seems like there are a couple of different pieces that would be required for it to be um, an ideal tutoring environment. Um, presumably some sort of form of AI, not just the data, um, what we would know, but how we would employ that data or, or at least a set of systems in place to use that data. Um, I, I don't know if that would be an ideal tutoring environment. Quite, it's in, in, I, I've read uh, Hariri's work. It, it, it's a little scary to me to think about that as the ideal tutoring environment, quite frankly. But. Well, that's one answer. Very good. Uh, Josh, do you want to jump in on that? I want to press on that, uh, actually, one point. This, you, you raised, both of you raised a whole series of terrific topics. Um, but let me just remind everybody, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question like Fred just did, uh, you can just type, hit that question mark button and you can type away. Or if you want to join us on stage, uh, you can just simply click the, uh, uh, the uh, raised hand button, and then you can join us on screen, which is easy as can be. Um, the, what I wanted to push on a little bit was the question of, of uh, faculty support. Uh, so as you mentioned, you know, we have uh, in the United States, the majority of faculty, the preponderance are uh, agents, and yet a lot of faculty support uh, structures are aimed at tenure-track faculty. Uh, are we experiencing something like a, a two-tier method of uh, 
faculty support? And if so, is that the way we should go forward or should we do something different? Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's hard to argue that there is not um, a bit of a, well, maybe a, a significant caste system um, in, in higher education today. Um, what the solution to that is, I think, uh, is, is an interesting problem. It's an interesting challenge. There are, are certainly, I think, important things about tenure and what that brings to the individuals who hold those positions. Um, and to, in, in some sense, to argue for greater support uh, for people without tenure um, pushes the needle away from tenure as a possibility rather than pushes the people without tenure toward the tenure space, right? So the, the tension does not seem to me, at least as it's been played out, over the past 10 to 15 years be moving in the direction of let's provide tenure for everybody. It is let's um, reduce tenure for, for more and more folks. Um, and you know, when you get into that place, I don't think you, you do anything necessarily to um, support and help um, contingent workers in, in this space. Um, that, that doesn't necessarily become uh, you know, what I would see as the, as the outcome, though it, it needs to be. And clearly, we're not doing our job um, in higher ed if we're not supporting the people who are doing uh, the most important work at the institutions, uh, teaching and help to, helping to develop and inform the students um, who are there. So it's, it's a, I think it's a significant problem. Yeah, if, if I felt like I had the perfect solution for that, uh, we would have written a different book. I understand, I understand. Uh, I appreciate both of what you just said. Um, if you're new to the forum, we've been looking at the question of uh, academic labor for several years now. Um, we have another question that's come in. Uh, we'll push this up on the screen. This is from the awesome Nate Angel, uh, associated with the Hypothesis. And Nate asks, if learning science tells us the most effective method is one-to-one -one human to human tutoring, how do you think of digital as supporting and or changing that hypothesis? Yeah, I like this one. Yeah, um, you know, the, uh, for the famous, um, uh, Matthew Hopkins, uh, student and instructor in a lot on the team. And how do you think, model. Yeah. Uh, how does, how does digital support or change that hypothesis? So uh, Brian, I think, has uh, gone dark again, <laughs> He's ghosting us. Um, I do think uh, in, in any, can, any educational environments, um, you know, there is a, uh, there's an ideal. Uh, there's an ideal uh, that, you know, we could imagine playing out in terms of a particular kind of learning engagements um, that is has all sorts of other challenges related to it and scale would be one of those things. It's a wonderful thing to imagine all learning to happen um, in one-on-one -on -one engagements. You can imagine, you know, the kind of uh, tutoring model, but even uh, even one to five or one to, you know, a reasonable number of students would, would, would be a better than one to 400 or one to 5,000. Um, can technology solve that problem? I think it can um, help with the scale problem and help to mitigate some of the engagement problem. Um, it, you know, it's obviously only going to, or at least in my mind, it's only going to get us part of the way between the two of those things, the deepest, richest teaching and learning engagements and what it means to scale 
to teach the most number of students. Once we take away that, or, or once we sort of look more carefully at that one-to-one -one model, you know, we have all sorts of issues and challenges uh, with equity and access. Um, you know, that that's it's it's a sort of idealistic model in a very very limited kind of way, um, and certainly does not does not scale out well. So technology, in my mind, kind of helps. From the scale end of the problem helps you kind of move move in toward the deeper and learning deeper learning engagement and there are there are obviously some some other ways in which technology can help but i don't think it necessarily solves that problem of the one-to-one -one engagement it just complicates it a little bit in some ways and provides a way of broadening that scale interesting interesting well those are good answers um thank you very much and hey, thank you for a terrific question nate worked with uh, hypothesis which is a terrific project i just want to Shout out to that. Um, and and great pun, use of hypothesis in your question. That was, that was it's, perfect. It's like he's the director of marketing or something. That's right. Um, so let me just uh, uh, ask everybody again. Um, it's that easy to ask questions, and you can tell that uh, it's that exciting for uh, Eddie and uh, uh, Josh to be able to answer them. So uh, please give us your, uh, your comments and questions uh, as we go. Um, well, let me ask, in, in the course of your work, uh, where have you found academic institutions doing this right? Where are the, the real leaders that are actually supporting these kind of transdisciplinary questions? Where are the ones that are actually institutionalizing this kind of innovation? Wow. Yeah, and I would also, I mean, part of your question, Brian, too, was the institutionalization of this work. Um, I think, as Josh is saying, we found a lot of really exciting things happening at a, at a lot of places, some with deeper um, kind of connection to the institution and the structures of the institution. But I would say a lot of this work is happening in kind of pilot phases. It's happening in these, these inter, uh, interspaces between things rather than it's kind of fully institutionalized across the, um, across the school. So one example of that is, um, you know, very few schools uh, that I know of actually have built this into, say, promotion and tenure mm. processes or are using it as a way of trying to address the question you asked earlier about contingent faculty members and how we actually support those. There, there are a lot of pockets of trying to think about the learning problem and how we engage with our students better. And we have some really amazing uh, examples of people who are just um, doing incredible work. But, you know, it's not as deep and as, <coughs> excuse me, part of the institution at most schools uh, to actually be part of the, the full structure that's been in place for a long time. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure at some point we'll talk a little bit about innovation and disruption and what that model looks like in terms of institutions. And there are a lot of different ways of thinking about that. And, and a lot of people have come down on different perspectives. But um, that problem of how you you institutionalize something or how you create versions of this that will have that kind of feedback loop at the institution to create change is a huge challenge. And so one concern we have with the interdisciplinary field is to do what Josh was just saying, to be able to share this information across institutions. Another is to give it a kind of footing at an institution where it's recognized as an important part of the work that needs to happen in this space. And so that resources and time, energy um, and attention are given to that work, um, not just at a particular moment of crisis or anxiety like the MOOC scare, um, but in fact, something that becomes part of the institutional DNA and activity of the institution. Uh, we had a quick question on that uh, for both of you. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Dan Obando, a student institute of technology. What kind of work precisely are you referring to? Scholars of teaching and learning? Do you want me to go, Josh? You want to tackle that one? I, we're trying to figure out how to alternate here. Or just, uh, <laughs> um, 
so I think uh, scholarship of teaching and learning solo work is actually is an, an incredibly important part of this work. It's um, it's one of the places where a lot of really in interesting research is happening in the teaching and learning space from a disciplinary perspective. It's an incredibly important part of the part of the work. I would say it's it's kind of a pillar of this space. Um, but actually, what we're talking about and what we're thinking about is how um, questions of teaching and learning. So a lot of the work that's happening in in um, in the solo space, uh, questions of technology and innovation, questions of analytics and data, big data, um, and kind of critical history and understanding of where higher ed, those kind of four areas, how they're coming together in this kind of interdisciplinary space. Um, and in doing so, uh, what we're interested in is not just what's happening in the classroom, which a lot of solo work tends to focus on, uh, but what's happening across the institution. How is the institution, how is higher ed as, an, as a, ecosystem, let's say, um, actually helping to think about this changing work and thinking about the changing attention to teaching and learning. So it's full spectrum in that sense. And, um, you know, I sort of engagement with, with solo work um, there, are, while there are a lot of projects that have cut across, you know, multiple departments and so on at institutions, um, a lot of it is still importantly and necessarily and wonderfully centered um, in the classroom what's happening. Um, and so it's a, it's a key pillar of that work. But I would say it's, it's part of not the, not the whole it sounds almost like a social movement. Go Bernie? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so. Well, uh, we do have someone here from New Hampshire, so that, that, that can right. uh, We have a, a Not for you, Brian. Vermont. Oh no, I'm talking about uh, Josh there. In, uh, in uh, we have uh, a, a video question coming in from Fred Bashirs. Uh, Fred, hi. You want to unmute yourself? I just. Uh, and muted myself. So my question is, what do you think of team teaching where students are Good point. Yeah. Uh I'm happy to take a stab at this, Josh. You want to? Uh, so I, I, I think you had a really wonderful, uh, long question um, with a lot of different pieces. But in terms of team teaching, I think there, it's an incredibly valuable um, experience, both for the students and for the faculty members. And in that sense, I think we all learn a lot. I'm, I'm team teaching a class right now. I team teach often. Brian, in fact, just came in as a, as a third member of our class uh, last week. Um, and in that engagement of having multiple perspectives for our students, I, I think can be incredibly important. Um, if this was not part of your question, but one of the things that I think um, is so important about that is students get an experience of different ways of thinking about the material and the questions at, at play in the, in, the, in the course at that time. So often today we're, we're struggling with, with, with difference and, and actually engaging in you know, what we might call respectful or civil or um, engaged dialogue. It's, it's something that is, um, you know, we have very, very, we have fewer and fewer examples of in public discourse in the public sphere. Um, but when you team teach, you have really a wonderful opportunity to, to show students um, what it means to engage with a colleague who you respect, um, but who you might differ with, um, who you might actually approach the problem with in a different way. Brian and I got into a very, very short, but I kind of interesting conversation about definitions of science fiction, for example. You know, what are what are the characteristics that that define that genre? And I, I think we both probably disagree on that. And that's a that's a wonderful thing for the students to see. Um, and I know that doesn't get quite at the heart of your question about groups and group dynamic, but um, to me, that's one of the great values of, of team teaching. Mm. Mm.
Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, yeah. A great story, thank you. We have uh, we have even more stories that are coming in and more questions. Uh, let me quickly bring up one from uh, RPS, who takes us back to an earlier point, um, wondering how do you think the rising cost of education, specifically at four-year colleges, will impact access to education and the adoption of distance learning? Yeah, can you see this on the screen here? I, I think you scared Brian away again. I think the um, I'm, one of the things I expected you to, to bring up, Josh, which we've talked quite a bit about and uh, I know is something of, of great interest to you is low cost online degrees, which might be one way of starting to think about how you address the economic challenge. Uh, certainly not the only way and it's certainly not going to um, solve the problem completely, um, but it, it starts to um, you know, open up other alternatives or, or other options. Um, and at, at kind of um, the base of that question and the base of, you know, the interest in low cost online degrees, 
um, is you know a question of equity and access. And um, institutions right now have to do this uh, a lot of work in um, paying attention to, to certainly institutions like um, the one that I'm at, um, the one that you're at, and um, institutions that have to pay attention to uh, equity and access in ways that I think they're they're starting to do. But um, there's a lot of work to do there. And so I, I don't have a, a you know a good answer on the cost degree, but this is where we start to explore the question and the problem. And this is, you know, what we're arguing needs to happen. And we're arguing that that needs to happen from a learning perspective, not from the perspective of policy first or, inst or you know, kind of the traditional structures of, of an institution first or technology first as the kind of disruption model is, is arguing. We're, we're saying that you, you really need to, to stop and pay attention to the question of what are we here for primarily, um, maybe first and foremost, if not only, um, to help students grow at this particular point in time in, the, in their lives, help them learn, um, not just to be to learn to, to get a career, but to become lifelong learners. Um, and how do we do that in the best possible way? How do we make that as equitable and accessible as possible? Um, and those, those, I think, are important questions to ask and to try to explore from that perspective of learning, not, not simply um, from policy or economic uh, perspectives alone. It's interesting how uh, in the different parts of this conversation where you focus on specific technologies or specific pedagogies, but now we also shift to the grand strategy of how campuses do their work uh, across all kinds of domains. We have uh, another question, uh, more questions have come in, um, and this is from uh, uh, Kurt Beer. So let me just put this up on stage. In the spirit of humanize OL for amazing folks like Michelle Bukansky Brock, what is the right balance of how much professors should be human with their students? Let me bring that up again. I must uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of at the um, core of that question is how much should faculty share or how much should they be open with their students about, say, um, struggles that they may have with health issues or say depression or something that might help them engage with other students and help to support them in their well-being? Is that kind of the core of that question, what it means to be human uh, with students? Um, I don't know why I put uh, human in air quotes, <laughs> but to be human with students. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think there are a lot of important reasons why that is an, an incredibly effective pedagogy. We know students um, learn better when they they are healthy, um, both physically and mentally healthy, uh, when they're in their best possible um, space to be able to, to learn. And um, whatever faculty members can do to help them get into that space, I think, is, is incredibly important and valuable to do. We have a lot of initiatives at Georgetown that pay attention to health and well-being of our students as well as of our faculty to try to make sure that that is part of what happens in the classroom and they've been incredibly effective programs. Um, the kinds of uh, stories that come from those programs, the experiences that the students have, the engagement that the students have with their faculty members who are willing to share that, uh, but also the engagements um, that the students have with the health professionals on campus, um, engagements that they wouldn't have had if the faculty members weren't willing to be open and, and engaged in that way. Mm. A great question. Um, and uh, if you would, uh, Kurt, if you want to follow up with that, um, please just uh, click the raised hand button. We'll be glad to join you on stage. To, uh, that. Yeah, I'm sorry if I answered the wrong question. I'm really good at, at that. Uh, no problem. Uh, I think that was a great answer. Uh, we have another question that's come up, uh, a whole stack of questions. This is from Charles Finley for Northeastern. It says that rapid change in technology in all professions requires provision for faculty learning. How do we prepare faculty to use new technology or the field so learners are prepared for the future? Yeah.
Oh. Oh. Great answer, great answer uh, for a really, really rich, really rich question. Charles, if, uh, if you want to follow up on that again, uh, either uh, if, you're, if you don't have a camera, just uh, give us another text question. We'd be glad to tackle it. Um, and we have uh, uh, a follow-up question from Nate Angel. Uh, and so I want to bring, uh, bring that back up uh, so you can see this. He asks, um, an EDU here in Oregon is closing after a drop from 85 or 8K to 5K students. The growth was from early success with online programs that they couldn't sustain. How do you see online affecting educational sustainability? Um, so that I'm assuming you're talking about Concordia. Um, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and which grew, grew incredibly quickly and then um, seems to have run into competition from other institutions that are kind of bringing online uh, to the fore and, and that certainly makes that a, that a challenge. Um, Brian, would you mind keeping that question up? I'm not sure. I'm starting to give context to the answer, but I'm not sure I understand fully the question. No problem. How do you see online affecting EDU? Um, well, I saw in the in the group chat there was a, a comment about the failure of technology, um, and it, it seems to me that you know there are a lot of arguments to make one way or the other about the effectiveness of technology and the value of technology in higher ed and. Um, you know, there's a lot of great, wonderful work that, that has happened to think about technology going, you know, as far back as the book and further um, as, you know, having a particular kind of impact on, on, on higher ed. Does online affect EDU sustainability? Well, it, I don't think it can do anything but affect the sustainability of a lot of institutions. Institutions are going to have to change for, to adopt and recognize that the world at large is changing, that, you know, is maybe a little bit different than what happened with the, uh, the advent of the internet and it's, you know, sort of infusion throughout um, higher ed, but technology continues to be part of how we engage with the world, how we engage with information. Um, and online is now going to become a modality that everyone is going to need to be, need to understand is part of the teaching and learning environment. You, we can't sort of ignore that, that fact. If you do, I think that'll have a particular kind of impact on, on the sustainability of that institution. If you ignore that online is happening, whether at a blended or hybrid level or fully online courses, but if you, you ignore it, then, then that's to your peril. If you invest fully in it and you don't recognize the value of residential education or you don't understand the need for students to have certain kinds of experience as well, I, my guess is that that will also have a, an impact on the sustainability of your, of your institution too. I think, you know, that, that, in any institution of higher education, it is an important balance of a variety of different complex forces. Now online happens to be one of those new forces that everyone is going to have to figure out how to balance. And if you just assume you replace something with online or you just assume that there's, well, let's keep our head in this, you know, hide our head in the sand and not pay attention to online, I think all of those things are, are to the peril of those institutions. That's, you know, however successful they are or not. Please do, please. Excellent. I have to agree. Um, I'm also conscious of time, and we have about eight minutes left. And I want to make sure that everyone who has a question or a thought um, can uh, can chime in. Uh, we have uh, uh, a question from uh, Art Frederick, and let me just bring that back up on uh, on stage, um, on the screen rather. Uh, he asks, uh, "Is there any role anywhere for OPMs in higher education?" 
Well, I think I think Josh uh, gave uh, one version of the answer. Josh and I argue about this all the time, um, but we I think we generally agree that there are things that institutions of higher ed can do well. There are things that are core capacities uh, for higher ed that they should do themselves, and there are things that it makes sense to partner um, with industry that do, that can do those things uh, more effectively or better. And, and I think part of the approach that most um, schools I would hope would take is to try to really identify what those core capacities are and not to give those up. And Josh men mentioned strategy, um, thinking about where you're going, what you're doing, not letting an external company determine your strategy for online, not letting an, an, an internal company um, actually take away your capacity to understand how to move forward in teaching and learning and innovation. Um, but are there things that OPMs can do? Absolutely. Um, you know, most institutions don't do uh, student recruitment in a particular kind of well, uh, way well. Uh, you know, marketing is, is often a challenge, for example. Um, so there are things that OPMs can bring to that. Are those OPMs, or are they just digital marketing firms? I, I would argue that if you get the right digital marketing firm and you build the capacity internally, you're better off than trying to work with an OPM that tries to bundle that packaging, even when it you know suggests that, that it's pulling that out. Um, but, you know, sure, there are things that OPMs, you know, can do. Well, then there's, there's a, a question that came in a few minutes ago that actually fits that perfectly. Let me just uh, flash this on the screen. Uh, this is from Jen Dick at uh, Phillips Academy Andover. Who asks, have you encountered any institutions that are doing a good job of fostering professional relationships between faculty and structural designers? Um, well, I, I actually don't want to talk too much about Georgetown, but I, I do think we do that well at Georgetown. And one of the reasons that we, we do that well is that um, our instructional designers, our, our learning designers, as we call them, um, are uh, excellent at thinking about the kind of full spectrum of engagements for, for teachers, for faculty, and students, whether that's face-to-face -face or hybrid or online um, at, at whatever scale. And when you're working with faculty, not just in an online modality, which a lot of instructional designers are, they're sort of they're pigeonholed into this one space, faculty are going to see those instructional designers in a very limited way. But if you're actually working with them in terms of faculty development and instructional design across a full spectrum, your, your partnership with them is, is, is so much more uh, significant, it's deeper, it's richer, and they come to rely on you and, and, and work with you in ways that are hopefully transparent, hopefully engaged, hopefully you both learn from each other, um, but you build a kind of trust and a partnership that I, that I actually think is harder to do with an OPM and harder to do if the instructional designers are just focused on online. It's one of the reasons we do what we do at Georgetown. That's a great answer. Um, and I have a, a question that, that should uh, delight you, Eddie. Uh, let me uh, put this on the screen now. This is from uh, when Mark Kozitska, a former student of yours, who is now a team lead at Penn State University doing learning and development. And Mark asks, to what degree do you see the demands and shifts in soft skills? Oh. Hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm gonna, I'll continue to read the question since Brian just froze. Uh, to what degree do you see the demands and shifts in soft skills shaping how? Oh, now the question is gone, so I'm, I lost that. What technology is being adapted and utilized, particularly in higher education? Uh, so Mark was a, a student in our learning design technology program. He's off doing amazingly wonderful things at Penn State. Um, it's great to hear from you, Mark. Um, I, 
we talk a lot in the program, and, and I think we talk a lot in uh, in our center about um, the importance of building relationships. That there's uh, you know so much of the work that we do, um, like what faculty members do with students, is build relationships that help all of us learn. And so the soft skills that I'm assuming you're referring to, Mark, are really um, about make, making sure we're good at building those relationships, that we learn how to do that, that we foster those relationships. Uh, some of us, like myself, are introverts, and so those relationships you know, are a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, some of us are extroverts, and we're really engaged in being outside and, and building those relationships. But we're, you know, kind of whatever part of that, that spectrum you're on, it's important that you understand that you're not there simply to provide a product but that you're there to actually build a, a learning relationship um, between you and the faculty members, between you and the students, and between the faculty members and the students you're, you're triangulating them. Mm. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Mark, but um, it certainly seems to me an incredibly important skill as we go forward. We, are, um, we don't often like to think about ourselves in this way, but we certainly are a relationship field. Indeed we are. Indeed we are. Great question, Mark. I'm glad to see you here. Uh, let me... Um, since we're at the last minute, let me just ask one quick question for the two of you to uh, wrap this up with, which is, what's your next book going to be about? Here you go, Josh. Fantastic. Good luck for both of you. Um, um, if everyone wants to buy your book, uh, we can grab Learning Innovation and the Future of Higher Education. Uh, this is, uh, as you can tell, a rich and important, thoughtful book uh, with a great deal to chew on and a lot of implications for higher education. Gentlemen, both of you, congratulations on, on publishing this, and I wish you all luck in its reception as well as in your next book. Thanks, Brian. Very much appreciate it. A uh, quick question before we go. What's the best way to keep up with both of you? Uh, well, as you said, Josh is all over Inside Higher Education. Uh, and we have a, a joint post that we publish every Wednesday, so that's probably a good place uh, to start. Very good. Um, and I, I really recommend that for both of you um, and for everybody here. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, uh, Ryan. But don't go away. Uh, let me just mention we have a few things on deck uh, for next week. So first of all, uh, on February 20th, we'll be working with Derek Bruff at Vanderbilt, who has a wonderful new book out called Intentional Tech. Uh, Derek is a wonderful, wonderful instructional designer, very deep thinker in terms of the intersection of education and technology, and really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, if you'd like to catch up on our previous programs, you can just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and you can grab a whole series of videos uh, stretching back almost now, four plus years. And if you want to keep talking about all these great issues about innovation, technology, education, relationships, soft skills, we have a whole bunch of channels for this. We have a Slack group, we have LinkedIn group, we have a Facebook group, and of course on Twitter, we are FTTE. We'd be delighted to hear from all of you there. So in the meantime, keep the conversation going. We'll see you online, and thanks for all the great questions. See you next time. Bye-bye.